Netflix has said that Cleopatra was black. Wrong. It said she was an all-powerful queen. Wrong. It said she was about to unite Rome and Egypt. Wrong. This is what happens when you mix Hollywood, a multi-billion dollar company like Netflix, and politics. You get this Frankenstein's monster of distortion. Hello and welcome to History Revealed. Today I'm going to be reacting to Netflix's Cleopatra documentary made by Jada Pinkett Smith. Very controversial TV series. Lots of people have been very unhappy with it from all over the world, including Egypt, the land it's set in. So let's get straight to it. There was a time long ago when women ruled with unparalleled power as warriors, queens, mothers of nations. They bowed to no man. Okay, already we're off to a very bad start. So apparently this queen ruled with unparalleled power. Well, not quite. There was constant infighting between Cleopatra and her brother and her sisters. Uh, constant. So she barely had a chance to sort of establish power or let alone be an absolute ruler, which I assume the people who are making this documentary don't like, but if it's a queen, it's okay. And uh, what was that? Didn't bow to any man? Well, Cleopatra might not have bowed to a man, but she did plenty of other things for men, such as Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, and I would tell you what those are, but uh, I may well get a community guideline strike if I do. Anyway, moving on. My grandmother was the inspiration for me. I would come home and I would tell her about what I was learning. You know, oh, we're learning about the Greeks and we're learning about the Romans. And today we learned about Cleopatra. And I remember clear as day her saying to me, Sholly, I don't care what they tell you in school, Cleopatra was black. Well, there it is. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. This is the basis of what all this is going to be about. I don't care what I, they told you in school. I don't care. Cleopatra was black. I don't care what they told you in school. Julius Caesar, he was a Chinese lesbian. I don't care what they told you in school. Mark Antony was an obese Irishman. Now, there might be sources, there might be texts saying otherwise, but your mother told you that Cleopatra was black. This is where we are. And this is, let's have a look. Who's this woman? Let's have a quick look, shall we? She is Professor Shelley Haley, a classics professor. So this is a professor telling you this. A professor is telling you Cleopatra was black. Someone whose job it is to teach, whose job it is to create, create works, uh, whether it be documentaries or academic texts or books, she is lying to you. And this is what Netflix are producing. Okay, good start, good start. Since 323 BC, a family originally from Macedonia, the Ptolemies. Thank God, they finally got something right. This is correct. So Cleopatra was part of the Ptolemaic dynasty. And the Ptolemaic dynasty was founded just after the death of Alexander the Great. Because when Alexander died, his empire was divided between his generals, who were called the Diadochi. And you then had the wars of the Diadochi. So Ptolemy, who was the man who received the, the province of Egypt. Various other generals got different different territories, Antigonus, Seleucus, um, Antipater. But um, Ptolemy's kingdom in Egypt, because Ptolemy became pharaoh, lasted longer than any of the others. So when others had been overtaken by the Romans or the Parthians, the Ptolemaic kingdom of, of, uh, of Egypt remained. ...have ruled Egypt, but now... A sudden shift of power will change the life of one teenage girl forever. Cleopatra was first and foremost a scholar. She was a scientist. She was a linguist. Those things mattered to her just as much, if not more, than politics. Can they hear themselves? if not more than politics. That's it, the science experiments, the fact she could meet multiple languages and reading books. That actually mattered to her a bit more than trying to take the throne. You know, she murdered her sister for politics, but she would have murdered her sister for science. She would have murdered her for, what was the other thing, to learn a new language. Just what they'd have you believe. My God. My God. Cleopatra was utterly single-minded in her pursuit of power. She'd do absolutely anything. Um, 
now yes she is true she was a linguist in the sense she did speak multiple languages and was the first egyptian ruler of the ptolemaic dynasty to speak egyptian because they were so isolated and so insular that they only really spoke greek uh, so the fact she spoke e egyptian was uh, was unusual and was noteworthy but um but the idea that this was this was somehow this was somehow the priority not politics again from a professor Cleopatra feels very close to the Egyptian people. Cleopatra learned the Egyptian language. True. She practiced the Egyptian religion. She wants to be remembered as Egyptian. We don't know her exact racial heritage. Yes, we do. We don't know who Cleopatra's mother was. There's been a lot of research to prove that her mother was Egyptian, but we can't know for sure. It's also uncertain who Cleopatra's grandmother was. Cleopatra's father was given a nickname which was illegitimate, so people recognized that his mother had probably been somebody who was at the royal court. It's possible that she was an Egyptian. Ancient Egyptians would have had a variety of different complexions, um, as we find in other African cultures today. Skin color ranged from black to pale brown, much to like white. the people of South Sudan to modern day Egypt. Okay, okay, right. So what they're doing here is taking some ambiguities in the fact that, okay, maybe we didn't know who, who the grandmother was or the mother or whatever they claim. We have many physical depictions of Cleopatra. Sculpts, sculptors uh, produced works, uh, statues of her, and we have sort of paintings of her. None of them portray her as being dark-skinned. She has ethnic Greek features, shocking, because she's from a Greek Macedonian dynasty, and she has pale skin in these things. They're, they're, they're so obviously looking for it you know having a conclusion and trying to work backwards this is the worst thing you should ever do in history start with a conclusion and then mold the evidence or lack of evidence in this case in order to fit your to fit your narrative but uh but this is what's uh, this is what's going on here given that cleopatra represents herself as an egyptian it seems very strange that we insist on depicting her as a wholly european She was from a European dynasty, a European dynasty which ruled Egypt. I, I, I don't know what's so hard about this. <laughs> if you look at her depictions, she looks different depending on who it is that's depicting her. So her representations change, her perceptions change. So she's almost like this chameleon. But in those depictions, she never looks black. <laughs> never. So uh, they're really taking liberties here. Okay, so so far you have a, a blend of, of fact and fiction. There's the fiction that she is black, she wasn't. And then you have, again, some of the ambiguities, not knowing the parentage, not knowing this, that and the other, or sort of stretching things, so stretching the fact that she was a linguist or that she was sort of interested in scholarly pursuits and making that sort of the centerpiece of her personality. So... Um, so anyway, let's see what we've got going forward. Cleopatra is this really confident woman with great charisma. She was obviously a diplomat. And actually, she's not bowing down to him. But like I said at the beginning, she's doing plenty of other things for him. She's kind of shifting the power dynamic. Julius Caesar is presented with this young woman who is strong, she was intelligent, and she was an African woman who saw herself not only as a ruler, but as a goddess as well. So she would have been very different to any other woman that Julius Caesar would have met in Rome. So, again, sort of like, she was African in the sense that she was born and lived on the territory of Africa, being in Egypt. However, she like she was very much part of a non-egyptian dynasty that was ruling egypt that, that has that can't be stressed enough in the same way that a roman plenty of romans were born outside of rome or italy 
and maybe even on the territory of Africa. It didn't really make them Africans as we understand it, no more than it made them, if a Roman was born in the territory of Asia, it made them an Asian or on Europe, Europe European, even though Roman Romans coming from Rome are sort of a European people. It's not quite how it works. See how they're sort of using a little sleight of hand there to uh, sort of dece deceive the viewer. Okay, so where we are now. Julius Caesar and Cleopatra have had an affair and they have produced a child Caesarian. That's the uh, point we are up to in the show. Cleopatra gives birth to Julius Caesar's child in her early 20s, probably around 22, and his name, Caesarian, Little Caesar. Perfect name. Caesarian embodies two great cultures, two great civilizations. There is no other child like him in the world. Okay, so plenty of world leaders at the time and after had illegitimate children. They did. And unfortunately, I hate to break it to him, but that happened. So Caesarian is the only one of Julius Caesar's illegitimate children that we know of. However, Caesar was a notorious womanizer. Uh, it's said that he slept with everything under the sun. So there's a good chance he had other illegitimate children. We don't know that, and they're not recorded, but the odds are in his favour. I mean, his soldiers even sang, sung songs about him where they talked about his womanizing and how I think one of them said they didn't have enough gold because it had all gone to pay his Gallic tart. That was the sort of man that uh, Julius Caesar was. It was not a big deal that she was not married to the baby's father. And considering that she was a ruler and then the baby's father's a ruler, this child could be the one that really unites Rome and Egypt. Unites Rome and Egypt? What does she think was going on at this time? I, I really wonder that. Because Rome was not a tolerant place for foreigners, especially foreigners who wanted to rule over them. The idea that Julius Caesar had it in his mind that somehow his son, his illegitimate son, with a foreign ruler, a foreign queen who was despised by many Romans, was going to be the ruler of a united Roman Egyptian world, whatever that would have looked at, looked like. It's just utter fantasy. And again, you have a an academic saying this, someone a supposed purveyor of truth say, saying this. I mean, this is sort of, this is real counterfactual stuff. Um, yeah, the, Roman, the Romans, bear in mind, Julius Caesar had lots of opponents um, in the way he was ruling, let alone sort of his son ruling, uh, ruling as a sort of Eastern style king slash Roman dictator, just beyond the realm of possibility. We're at the point now where Cleopatra is in Rome to see Julius Caesar, and um, there is a party being held where Julius Caesar, Cleopatra, and many other prominent Romans, Mark Antony, Cicero, various others are in attendance. So let's see what they've got to say about that. Cicero, this important Roman senator, dislikes Cleopatra. And there is a letter where he says she's insolent and arrogant, and I, he says, I hate her. I meant no disrespect. I forgive you. It's not every day Rome welcomes a queen. Rome has never had and never will have a queen. And whilst I have the utmost respect for your ancient civilization, that's just it. It's ancient. Rome is the future. There is no future without the past. There is no Rome without Egypt. Are you seriously suggesting that we would not have existed without you? I'll leave you to ponder that. But okay, so it is well known that Cicero didn't like Cleopatra. That's well known. He thought she was arrogant. Yes, he did. He did not like her. He hated her. But uh, bear, in mind, bear in mind, Cicero was a great defender of the Roman Republic, and this is an Eastern absolute monarch. So, in in and she is she as he well knows she is influencing Julius Caesar. So he has every reason not to like her. Um, it does look a bit like, and we will carry on. I I've done my research. I couldn't find evidence of this sort of conversation taking place between Cicero and Cleopatra. Um, and it does seem to be a bit of a sort of 
extension of of the letters and of the writings rather than a recorded conversation between the two of them. Let's, uh, let's carry on. Finally, a guest who actually elevates the conversation. <laughs> a toast to Cleopatra. At last. <laughs> Someone who has bested Cicero. <laughs> <laughs> Rome was a... Okay, so yeah, I mean, this is this is red meat to Netflix, isn't it? Sort of, uh, sort of confident black woman stands up to old white man. Uh, well, again, Cleopatra wasn't black, and did this actually happen? Probably not. Maybe, uh, who knows? But uh, they may have had a conversation. Did go anything like that? What is true though is that Mark Antony did not like Cicero did not like him at all, and Cicero did not like Marta Mark Antony. So it, it's believable that that sort of thing happened. But in terms of sort of elevating the conversation, what he describes, Cicero was one of the most brilliant minds of not just, not just that period in Roman history, but of sort of the whole history of the Roman Republic. If you're looking at someone's writings, uh, sort of a prominent intellectual's writings, Cicero is number one. I can't. I can't think of anyone else who who could be better than him. Maybe maybe others were sort of on his level, perhaps even his equal. But this is this is the best of the best in terms of intellect. And his his ideas, his works, were studied to this day and were have been studied throughout history and made significant uh, advances, intellectual advances um, throughout history, ranging from the sort of Renaissance time to the present day. So the way they're making Cicero look like this sort of petty man, sort of being bested by by a young queen is a stretch at best, if I'm being very generous. Okay, so the point we're at now is Julius Caesar's been assassinated and the whole of Rome is waiting to see who has been named his heir. And this is what the uh, academics on the show are now discussing. Mark Antony had some expectation, realistic or not, that he might be the great man's heir. Cleopatra expects that this is going to be Caesarion. So this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun because up to this point, the show is built up that you know Caesarion is the future. Cleopatra is right to expect that Caesarion will be the future. And um, yes, uh, and, you know, painting the picture that Cleopatra... Cleopatra meant so much to Caesar and this was her opportunity and then reality hits home because Caesarian wasn't even considered in the in the will it was Octavian and so I wonder how I wonder how they'll try and spin that one the fact that uh, Julius Caesar didn't give Cleopatra or Caesarian a moment's thought when he was devising his will it was his, his uh, great nephew Octavian later Augustus who is his uh, sole heir Octavian, Caesar's great nephew. He named him heir. Why would he name someone no one has ever met when he has an heir? Because he didn't consider Caesarion his heir. Why are they made? I mean, did Cle was Cleopatra that naive? I mean, I think there's actually a negative portrayal of Cleopatra here. You know, they they're portraying her as sort of this naive girl who was genuinely confused when her own son, her own bastard son, with Julius Caesar, wasn't considered to be his heir. That's just my view. Did you okay, so here we have the unfolding of the next part of Cleopatra's story. Caesar is dead, and she has to realign herself with Mark Antony, uh, who is a rival of Octavian. Octavian is now Caesar's heir, and he's taken the name of Caesar. He's Octavius Caesar at this point. And... Um, he he is a very powerful man and he's part of this next stage of the triumvirate. So um let's see what unfolds. Word is sent to Octavian to tell him that he is the heir. Mark Antony tries to gather his supporters. So there's gonna be a little bit of a power play and some saber rattling. Cleopatra departs Rome after Caesar's assassination. We can imagine that she is devastated by her loss. She's not only lost a lover and a friend, but also her main political alliance. 
Now that I do agree with. Finally, they've said something sensible, even though they had to mix it with some rubbish. So lost a lover and a friend. Well, a lover of convenience, yes. A friend, I don't really think Cleopatra had any friends as such. Um, you know, if Julius Caesar wasn't useful to him, to her, would she really have cared? Highly unlikely. However, however, it is true that she lost an ally and her son, whilst he might not have been the king of Rome, it did give her some leverage in some way over, at least, apart from anything else, emotionally over Julius Caesar. Okay, so the point we're at now is that Mark Antony and Cleopatra, star-crossed lovers, were together in Egypt. They had a family together because Antony was in charge of the eastern provinces of the Roman Republic or becoming an empire at that time. And he was an ally of Cleopatra as well. He, she helped him with his Parthian campaign. And But it's crunch time. So this is where sources do matter. So Cleopatra was maligned in the sources and that was a deliberate policy of Octavian. So he wanted to portray Cleopatra as a seducer, as a threat, as a as a uh, a woman who had used uh used her, her guile to overcome this this Roman, Mark Antony. And there are elements of truth in that, however, it was very much exaggerated for political political gain on Octavian's part. And so we are now at the Battle of Actium, which is one of the most significant battles in history, because this is this is truly the battle that creates the Roman Empire, because it really confirms Octavian as the um not quite the sole ruler yet, but the um the the sort of un unimpeachable Un uncontested ruler, uncontested is the word I, I'm looking for, of Rome, because he defeats he defeats uh, his last re remaining serious rival, Mark Antony, at this naval battle off the Greek coast uh, with his commander, Marcus Agrippa. So let's see how Netflix has decided to portray this and Cleopatra's actions in the battle. That will be very interesting. Once the battle begins, Mark Antony and Cleopatra are on separate ships. Mark Antony leading the fleet at the front and Cleopatra behind. On the morning of September 2nd, Mark Antony and Cleopatra attempt to punch through the blockade that Octavian has at the Bay of Actium. Now Mark Antony and Cleopatra combined have fewer ships than Octavian. The other major difference between the two navies is that Mark Antony's ships are much larger. They have more firepower, but they also are way less maneuverable than Octavian's lighter ships. This is correct. Um, in a sense, Mark Antony had quality on his side and Octavian had quantity. Cleopatra and Mark Antony both made a series of problematic battle decisions which is sort of surprising due to the fact that they're both pretty savvy, but they strung out their fleet uh, and allowed themselves to become trapped. We're told by the Roman sources that Cleopatra, when she realized that Mark Antony was being defeated, turned her ships around and decided to sail back to Alexandria. Interesting how they... Uh how they use words there. We're told by the Roman sources, as if it might not be true. Now, there's no other sources that said she stood and, fight and fought, but the Roman sources said that she fled. And that that is what we understand of the battle, is that Cleopatra took her around 60 ships and, uh, and fled Mark Antony. And when seeing her flee, Mark Antony then tried to flee, and the remaining uh, ships loyal to Antony, uh, it was over for them. And the battle was a terrible defeat for Antony and Cleopatra. Terrible defeat. There was no recovering after that. Octavian was uh, was the top dog after this battle, and most of uh, most of Antony's troops who were on are on land defected to Octavian. She doesn't want to be captured. There would have been no point at all in her staying in a battle that they're effectively losing. Well. You stay in the battle to try and win it, and you'll guarantee you lose if you leave. So I don't know how exactly she came to the judge. Maybe she was about to lose, but uh, you know they portrayed her as this brave woman, this sort of warrior woman, and then the one involvement she does have in a battle 
she acts, if you believe the Roman sources, as they say, quite cowardly, just fleeing the battle and without telling Antony. So I that's a bit of a a bit of a hole in their narrative there of this uh, this brave this brave Egyptian queen who fled. Her primary goal remains the safety of her own kingdom, the safety of Egypt. She has no choice but to try to make it back to Egypt with as many of her ships as possible. If she loses all of her navy at the Battle of Actium, Egypt will be defenseless. Well, as it happens, uh, Egypt wasn't quite defenseless, but it had no chance. Once the fleet was defeated, Octavian was completely dominant. He had the troops, he had the ships, he wasn't going anywhere, and yeah, it was game over for them. Okay, so we're at the end of the series here, and what we've seen so far is half-truth after half-truth, lie, one big lie, lots of other small lies in between, and this is this is the end this is how they conclude it so let's uh let's see what they've got to say to conclude it and then we'll give uh i'll give my final thoughts i would have this recurring dream where there was this shadowy figure certainly an ancient person clearly a woman who would say to me you have to tell my story you have to do it I want people to know the story of Cleopatra because she was an African queen. And that's a fact that's been buried, it's been erased, it's been whitewashed. Okay, I knew I wasn't going to enjoy this. They think, do they genuinely think it's been covered up? That she was black all along? There was evidence that she was black and everyone hid it. She was this proud black African woman. People call her a Macedonian Greek, or there was elements of, of, of Macedonian Greek in her, but first and foremost, she was an African queen. Oh my God, again, professors, professors telling you this. Suppose the people who we rely on to guard truth are saying this sort of thing. Her story resonates, I think, with every woman. Okay, okay, that's enough. That's enough. Her story resonates with every woman. Do, did every woman have such such arguments with their brothers and sisters that they wanted them dead? <laughs> did every woman get that? And uh, what else? Oh, did every woman marry their brother? Every woman, well, had affairs with two separate Romans or two separate whatever foreigners. Put it, what insert whatever f foreign nationality you want, and have illegitimate children with them and uh how many how many women see themselves as as gods like she did she saw herself as the god isis uh yet it sounds like she can resonate with very few women very few women in fact in fact i'd, I'd see if you can do it when you watch this video write in the comments have you ever met a woman who's tried to murder her brother tried to murder her sister who succeeded and um thought herself as a god had affairs with several men and children with those men, all the while trying to become the absolute ruler of an African kingdom. If you know a woman who resonates with that, please let me know in the comments. She will live on until there's no one else to tell her story. Oh, thank God that's over. So to conclude, Netflix has said that Cleopatra was black. Wrong. It said she was an all-powerful queen. Wrong. It said she was about to unite Rome and Egypt. Wrong. This is what happens when you mix Hollywood, a multi-billion dollar company like Netflix, and politics. You get this Frankenstein's monster of distortion, which tries to tell you that the real history was this monstrosity that I've just shown you. And people are expected to believe it. And this is where we are. Now, that is all we've got time for today and thank you very much for watching please please like and subscribe bring the notification bell and leave a comment uh, leave a sacrifice to the god of the algorithm really would really help the channel uh, so please do that and i will see you on the next episode